last section from the transmission lines, I hope. Anyway, before we looked at the transient behavior of transmission line, and we looked at the case where we had an infinite rise time. In this case, it, uh, it's a similar type of graph, but we have a finite rise time. And as you can see, what happens here is the uh, basically the waveform is the same, but it's uh, rounded out a little bit. Uh, some animations you can look at. Here's a very nice site. You can set some uh, parameters for source impedance, characteristic impedance, line impedance, um, load impedance rather, and the length of the line, things like that, and uh, uh, apply a step voltage and see what happens. So anyway, here's an, uh, an assignment. Play around with various impedances and see what happens and try to reproduce the three examples that we looked at. An integrated circuit, uh, CMOS integrated circuit, the transient behavior is, also, is going to be dominated by a capacitive termination because the load in, in CMOS is capacitive. We're talking to a, a gate of, a, of a, an inverter or something. Uh, so it's an MOS type of uh, gate we're talking to directly. And that's going to provide us with a, a load capacitance, C load, as we saw many times before when we were looking at the estimating the delay associated with the gate. Anyway, now it's uh, complicated by the fact that we're driving that uh, capacitor with a, a characteristic impedance of a transmission line. So in the following figure, we have a 50 ohm characteristic impedance, and it's uh, being dri driving a 2 picofarad load. So that provides us with roughly something on the order of a 100 picosecond time constant, and that wouldn't include the time of flight for the signal to propagate down the line. <coughs> so after the time of flight, we get an asymptotic response, and this is the output voltage here, let's say rising. And uh, one of the things that we notice here is that on the source, uh, there's a dip in the, the voltage, even though it was a matched load. As uh, in the previous slide, if we looked at uh, the source voltage, would have immediately gone to 5 volts. This is not obvious, but it eventually gets to the to where it should be, and a bit, dis bit of discussion on the following page why that might be the case. So upon reaching the destination, the instant wave is reflected. The load voltage uh, uh, approaches its final value asymptotically. But since the destination voltage is initially zero, it's a capacitor, so it's tied to zero immediately, uh, the reflection is minus 2.5 volts instead of the 2.5 volts that we'd expect in the open circuit case. Uh, and that's sort of the uh, what's responsible for that V source temporarily going to zero, and that gradually disappears as the output node reaches V max. So other things that we might have to consider are a lossy transmission line. This is where the resistance of the on-chip wiring is large enough such that the T-line on-chip might have to be considered as lossy. So they effectively have I squared R kind of loss. Uh, the response of a lossy RLC line to a step input combines sort of the wave propagation characteristics as well as diffusion component. So basically the signal will experience some attenuation. Uh, this is sort of a schematic illustration of what that might mean. We applied a step at x equals zero. Uh, some time of flight later, let's say at uh, x equal uh, x2, we get a rounding out of that voltage edge, and if we're far enough down the line, basically it's looking like an RC type of time constant down here. Uh, these values would be uh, attenuated by by distance down the line. So these things probably wouldn't also be going to the same uh, height. Uh, so the signal still propagates as a wave, but it attenuated along the line, and this is sort of what the attenuation characteristic might look like sort of an exponential decay with the distance and the resistance associated per unit length of the line. So in this case the model is that of an arrival of a wave followed by diffusive relaxation to a steady state solution at some point x. So I guess eventually it's going to get to the value that you put on the input. Uh, so the further from the source the more it looks like an, an RC network. And this happens when R, which is equal to the resistance per unit length times the length, is considerably greater than 2Z0. Um, this sort of to add a little bit of insult to injury, if you're looking at the transient behavior of a lossy T-line, the actual wires are much more complex uh, reflections at every T-line tap and uh, every via, and these all give impedance mismatches, which basically contribute to uh, a lot more uh, distortion and, and you know reflections on the line. The analysis is extremely complicated, certainly wouldn't have an analytical uh, solution, and uh, you probably still just have approximate numerical techniques uh, for those cases in any event. Uh, here, for example, shows a Xenon 7500 processor around 2010. Uh, sort of the question would be like, you know, what would be the expected number of T lines in here? I imagine most of these lines, the lion's share of them for sure, are very short and we be modeled as a, a lumped element, but uh, some of them might be long enough that you have to consider a transmission line effect. <coughs> 
the situation basically gets messy pretty fast. Uh, here's a situation where we just had a, a simple line that uh, you know, bifurcates into two other lines. And even at this little point here, uh, we're going to see that we're going to have a, a reflection coefficient. Because if we're looking this way down this line, we see Z0. We look down here, we see Z0. So the reflection coefficient looking into here, we can calculate as minus one third. And that was just where we branched off into two different wires. So there's certainly lots of uh, opportunity for uh, mismatch reflection and, and transmission of signals. Uh, there are some design rules of thumb. Some of these we saw already. The, if the transmission line effects are considered when the rise or fall time is smaller than the time of flight. So that's sort of the, the first rule of thumb that we might follow. And for example, for an on-chip wire, uh, maximum length might be one centimeter. Transmission line effect would be the case if T rise and T fall were less than 150 picoseconds, which it certainly can be, and the line were on the order of a, a centimeter long, which it probably isn't. But this would still be the case if, if obviously, if these values were much smaller and the line were much shorter. So in class assignment here, what is the reasonable value for uh, velocity? So another design rule of thumb is transmission line uh, effect should be considered when the total resistance of the wire is less than 5 times Z0. We sort of looked at that in the previous case when we we're looking at the attenuation down the line. If that's not the case, then a distributed RC network probably can be used. And uh, if you combine 1 and 2, um, you can sort of summarize a, a regime in which a transmission line, transmission line effect should be considered. So L in this regime here uh, means that that piece of wire is going to look like a transmission line and it'll go from a lossy to lossless to a lossy line. If L is shorter than that, it's easy to handle, it's lumped. And if L is longer that, than that, from what I read, it sort of looks like a distributed RC, but there's still going to be a propagation time for the signal to get down there. So that's that third rule of thumb. The transmission line is considered lossless when the total resistance is substantially less than the characteristic impedance of the line. So a rule of thumb would be R wire is less than Z0 by 2. This is sort of an interpretation for design rules of thumb. At least I think it is. Here's a buffer out here. If the line is very short, so our rise and fall time is greater than the time of flight, we look at like a lumped C and it have the R of that inverter there. Um, in that other case, when we're a little, when the a uh, time of flight is is uh, you know satisfies this equation out here where it's longer than than t rise or t fall by quite a bit. Uh, the line can be considered lossless as long as our wire is less than z naught by two. So it'd be lossless in here and correspond to all those cases that we looked at uh, from the previous um, examples. Uh, this case here where um, we're greater than z naught by two but less than five z naught, we're going to get some attenuation along that line. And after this uh, point in time, uh, at least from what I read, it says it looks like a distributed RC. Um, whether that's true or not, don't know for sure. So if we get another example here, um, we look at aluminum wire. It's M1 from a you know a 0.25 micron process, so pretty old. So it's routed over a top uh, uh, over top of a field oxide. So that oxide was silicon dioxide probably, and we would look up then the capacitance that's given as. Uh, 30 attofarads per uh, square micron, and then there would be a fringe or sidewall capacitance. So this is sort of the metal over the oxide. This is the side of the metal, uh, 40 attofarads per micron. So that's a linear measure. That's a area measure. We can then calculate the capacitance per unit length. So we end up with something like that. And depending on the width, it's going to have a different capacitance per unit width, per unit length. And then in this case, if the sheet resistance of aluminum was 75 milliohms per square then the resistance of the wire is going to be uh, 0 0.075 uh, per width ohms per micron. So depending on the width of the wire, if the wire were wider, the resistance goes down. If the wire is narrower, the resistance goes up. In which case, we can estimate the propagation velocity since we know it's SiO2. Uh, basically, we know what the velocity is, and it's half that of the speed of light. And for different values of widths, uh, we know we can calculate the capacitance per per micron, and then we can calculate the characteristic impedance because we know the velocity, we know the capacitance uh, per unit length. So for one micron wide wire, we can ask yourself what the maximum wire to consider a T-line effect might be, and it turns out that it's going to be 4 millimeters. So just working through those calculations. So half a centimeter roughly.
So the maximum rise and fall time for that input signal would be on the order of 67 picoseconds, which certainly could be considerably less than that, so you'd be considering it a transmission line. Uh, for a 10 micron wide wire, the top level metal, uh, L max is uh, almost a centimeter long. So, and uh, the rise and fall time would, would uh, be on the order of 188 picoseconds, or uh, considerably less than that, likely. So 5 gigahertz kind of regime. So the point is that on-chip it's a concern, in addition to off-chip where high-speed line, long lines also look like transmission lines, it's uh, probably even more of a concern. So here's an exercise, this one you have to do um, if you're taking the course, uh, using PSCAD, that's a power system simulator a CAD tool, it's most popular in the world, developed by HVDC Research Center in Manitoba here. Although it's not intended for ICs, it's still useful for insights, so basically see if you can download it and get it to resemble something that looks like a printed circuit board uh, transmission line. Alternatively, if you don't want to do that, you can try to determine the range of L um, that where you see transmission line effects in a CMOS circuit. So look up sort of modern, te modern processing technologies and try to find out what that value of L might be. So more likely you're going to find a length where the line should be considered transmission line uh, or at least where it would be important to consider a transmission line. And keep in mind there's probably lots of very short lines where that wouldn't be the case and perhaps uh, a few long lines where it wouldn't be the case as well. So some of the takeaways looked at some simple but uh, better than nothing delay estimations like lumped RC, looked again at distributed RC briefly, uh, looked at some basic T-line concepts in the const context of a CMOS integrated circuit, able to do some simple lattice reflection diagrams and appreciate more complex signal propagation. Uh, we did not consider crosstalk, but if we were to, we'd have to take into a case where we have one line that's sitting next to another and some of the uh, the energy could be coupled from one line to the other, i.e. The, the perhaps get a voltage glitch on this wire here when we're passing a voltage pulse through this wire. So whether this is accurate or not, you get the point that, that this is a signal we were looking at and it's, and it's uh, basically also induced a, a voltage on the second line. So maybe this would be a little bit more realistic where we pulse one line here and the other line sees a glitch on the transitions. So that's the end of uh, five star, the additional lecture for lectures for section five. Um, here's another uh, T-line reference from the uh, EDN magazine that you might want to look up. Um, and I think there was a couple of other little things. Oh, this other point, this out. There's a little uh, toolbox for uh, calculating uh, uh, crosstalk um, online, if you like.